you and I as individuals have agency in this world and we have the power to change the direction that we as individuals go in and subsequently we as collective humanity go in. The scientific method is elegantly simple. It goes as follows. Observation, hypothesis generation, predictions that stem from said hypotheses, and experimental design to test those predictions, and then falsify or verify your hypothesis. Boom. That simple. So that is the method. But what's held up as science in today's day and age is questionable to say the least. I was watching a podcast yesterday with Uber Boyo and a guy called Jason Reza Giorgiani. And in this podcast, Giorgiani describes how there is no objective reality. But that there are multiple models that come from science and the scientific method that work in certain domains and don't work in others. And that what these models do, what their function is, is to amplify an individual's power in a given domain. And that's it. Science is not about truth. It's about power. Truth is only some particular perspective or way of framing things that is ultimately serving the amplification of capacity in one or another domain. And recognizing that as a scientific spirit, and there's a, an ethos that comes along with that, which we need to be cultivating now. It's not about finding objective reality or truth with a capital T, but it's about amplifying your power in a given domain. So that sort of resonated with me, despite believing that there is an objective reality, which there must be. But to think that we humans can construct this sort of singular, monolithic, absolute perspective on reality is arrogant. And I think there's a lot of hubris in that. So if the scientific method is simply an earnest and honest inquiry into the workings of reality, then it doesn't follow from that, that we need to construct an absolute perspective. So if that's true, if it doesn't follow that we need to have an absolute perspective, then what we might say is, why the impulse towards constructing an absolute perspective? That becomes a bit suspicious. And Steph has something to say about that. This desire for us to construct these massive, singular, absolute, deterministic notions of like perfect order and all this basically eradicates this, this real reality in the world of like competing forces. And if anybody's trying to shove that into your head, they're actually more than likely trying to impose some type of matrix upon you as a system of control, because it's not in any way, re it's actually a very simple idea that's very useful to put people into slavery because it makes them think that everything's this sort of binary and black and white um, sort of suggestion an idea. If this impulse to creating a monolithic, singular, absolute, all-encompassing perspective on reality is actually just a means by which some people will trap or imprison the masses, obviously to the detriment of the masses, but to the benefit of those who are imposing this matrix on the masses if it is that then what the spirit of science is is a rejection of such slavery or enslavement and it's the willingness to step up adopt personal responsibility not for the sake of pleasing others or doing as you're told no a 
adopt personal responsibility for the sake of cultivating space in your life where you have the freedom to create, to engage in creative endeavors. That's what the scientific spirit is, or the spirit of science. And that's what Georgiani is speaking to when he invokes the archetype of Prometheus. I can argue that there's an ethics intrinsic to technological science. It's the ethics of the mad scientist who wants to be able to work in a community where his research and his capacity for discovery is sustainable, right? So if you, if you want scientific discoveries to take place and you want them to be the basis for technological innovation, you want to expand uh, horizons. I was going to say the horizon of humanity, but actually we're talking about the directed evolution beyond the limits of the human here, right? But if you want a, a, a constant expansion of horizons and you want these scientific discoveries to also uh, inspire technological innovation and uh, the development of new techniques to enhance our capacities and to uh, amplify our flourishing, then obviously you cannot live in a uh, totalitarian or even an authoritarian, uh, conservative and regressive society. Obviously, these two things are contradictory. So it's intrinsic to the scientific spirit to also embrace resistance to tyranny and the protection of personal liberty and the right to explore, to explore in terms of your trains of thought and your, uh, your um, imaginative uh, exercises and so forth, right? I mean, freedom of thought and freedom of expression are necessary conditions for the technological scientific enterprise. So right there, you have the basis for let's say a value system, right? One that's committed to exploration and discovery that's uh, you know, motivated by the will to invention and innovation and that uh, seeks to protect personal liberty and calls people to resist tyranny, authoritarianism, let alone you know, totalitarianism. And starting from those basic principles, you can elaborate an entire sociopolitics. You can develop a whole ethical framework, uh, you know, based on that. That would be, let's say, um, it would be against censorship. It would be against any form of, of thought control. It would be against the imposition of any dogma by institutions, whether religious or scientific. Uh, it would be an ethical system that would also prohibit any uses of technology to atrophy or degrade human capacity, right? Because the whole point of the scientific spirit, what drives the mad scientist is to increase power. If we wind up using genetic engineering to turn ourselves, genetic engineering and, and cybernetics, to turn ourselves into something like the Borg, some hive-minded, you know, collective where there's no individuality or capacity for uh, independent discovery and, you know, uh, where basically our relationship to technology is one of parasitism. We don't invent anything ourselves. We run into some other species that's invented something and then we assimilate them. That's a parasite, right? So any technological applications that would degrade humanity into something like a hive-minded collectivist Borg species which I would argue is a real danger when China, if China is to be allowed to drive technological development, those would also be prohibited. So you would have regulation, you would have, you know, something like law and order, but it would be about maximizing human capacity and human freedom um, and uh, resisting anything that's going to suffocate us and degenerate us. So point being, I think the scientific spirit has implicit within it its own ethos. And this was an argument that I made beginning in Prometheus and Atlas, um, where I argued that science and technological development are a historical expression of the archetype of Prometheus. And Prometheus 
is an ethical icon as well, not to say a religious icon, right? I mean, Prometheus is not just the gift giver of technological science, the, the one who stole the fire of the forge and the light of science from Olympus to you know, uh, empower mankind. Prometheus is also the great rebel, the trickster who defies authority, right? The enemy of totalitarianism, right? He's the freedom fighter, the pirate. So the rebel, okay? So yeah, I would say the scientific spirit has intrinsic within itself its own ethics. And that what I'm trying to do to a great extent is to unpack that ethics, to unfold it, and to you know bring as many people to recognize it as possible before we go down you know the wrong trajectories uh, in terms of our navigation of this technological singular singularity. So to try and tie this all off, getting back to Giorgiani's work, if the cosmos truly is discontinuous and there is no overarching logical structure of completed possibilities where everything is sort of predetermined or deterministic or mechanistic, if that's true. And instead, the cosmos is made up of this sort of, what he says, irreducible and ineliminable strife and conflict between opposing forces. Then that means that you and I as individuals have agency in this world and we have the power to change the direction that we as individuals go in and subsequently we as collective humanity go in. But that sort of a message isn't being fostered in today's culture. Rather, the opposite of that message, this idea of the world sort of being fixed and you simply having to fit in where we tell you. That sort of a message is being propagated in the minds of people nowadays, but it shouldn't be. And I feel like the message that Durjani and Nietzsche and then Uberboyo, Steph, what the lads are trying to say is we need to break out of that restrictive, almost like matrix-like worldview and see ourselves as agents of change see ourselves as having the power to co-create the world that we live in and that's a beautiful message <laughs>